As the 18th SEO Annual Summit gets underway in eastern China, I'll be talking to a former Deputy Prime Minister of Kazakhstan to see if the two countries are ready to take their 26-year-old diplomatic ties even further. And my exclusive interview with a photographer from Singapore who has been documenting the day-to-day -day life in North Korea. What's the country really like? Welcome to The Point. I'm Li Xin. This year marks the 26th anniversary of diplomatic relations between China and Kazakhstan. The two countries have witnessed the bilateral ties growing by leaps and bounds in a relatively short period under the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was launched in 2001. Energy cooperation has been a big part of the picture. The China-Kazakhstan oil pipeline, China's first direct oil pipeline, runs 2,800 kilometers from Kazakhstan to northwest China. Oil started to be pumped in 2006. Now, 12 years on, are the two countries ready to push their economic relationship to a higher level? I talked to Kairat Kelimbetov, a former deputy prime minister of Kazakhstan and now the governor of the Astana International Financial Center. I started by asking him how important the major joint projects with China, such as the first oil pipeline, are to Kazakhstan. Yeah, I think it's very much important. So first of all, uh, it's very much important from the energy security point of view that we have a very diversified route of our oil and gas pipeline and we are a significant supplier to the Chinese market in terms of the oil and gas and uranium raw materials. Uh, also very much important to develop the uh, biggest dry port in the world in Corbos, which I think that uh, now converted from the previous stage of bottleneck now to more opportunity to really connect Eastern European and, uh, and uh, Asian markets. And I mm -hmm. think that the Kazakhstan can benefit from this transit position to, to really, through Kazakhstan, we, we now uh, see a lot of the containers from China towards uh, Europe and from Europe back uh, to China. And uh, definitely for Kazakhstan, is very good in the future. But I believe that we also have to think about more uh, in, let's say the other layers of the uh, Belt and Road is not just physical infrastructure, it's also financial infrastructure, it's also digital infrastructure. Well, talk, talk to us about this financial infrastructure, what is being done and what progress is, has been made. I think the uh, last five years we agreed between the central banks, there is an agreement between Central Bank of Kazakhstan and PBOC that we have a a cooperation on a car in a trade on national currency. We have an agreement on a currency swap, which is uh, with the size $1 billion. We also have certain understanding how trade should happen in national currencies in our uh, economic corridor in Gorgos. Mm -hmm. We recently created the new uh, international financial center in Astana. And by the way, we created from scratch new stock exchange and the significant part of this stock exchange belongs to Shanghai Stock Exchange. And we believe that AAFC would be a good destination for Chinese financial institutions to come. Well, you talk about financial cooperation, uh, but we understand that capital doesn't always see eye to eye with the governments in what is the most important project. So what can be done to better leverage uh, the, the, the ability that the financial cooperation can have to boost... Uh, yeah. Yeah, the I, I think the Kazakhstani approach is very pragmatic. So I think all the projects, infrastructure projects especially, have to be commercially viable. The project has to be bankable. Otherwise, it's very difficult to finance. And uh, it shouldn't be white elephants. It should be really project which is uh, from one side commercially viable, from the other side it's a huge need for them uh, uh, now. And I think that uh, what uh, the lessons would be concluded from the last five years, so we have to have any kind of a center of expertise which will help the infrastructure, which is some kind of be infrastructure financing facility hub. We know that our colleagues in Hong Kong start to structure a different infrastructure project in their part of the world. We want to do the same in Kazakhstan for Central Asia mm -hmm. and for Kazakhstan. You also talk about digital infrastructure. What is being done in that regard? Yeah, I think uh, we all learn from the revolution in China in terms of the financial inclusion and leapfrog to the new destination of the financial transactions so we come, you enjoy the, the different uh, services from the social media 
like from uh, Bichat, uh, from Tencent or Alibaba or Baidu. And we now also start to build this uh, new legislation for the uh, startup companies, for fintech uh, community, for e-commerce community. Mm -hmm. And we are in close touch with Shanghai, with Hangzhou, Shenzhen, and we would like to bring those companies as much as possible to Kazakhstan. Well, in November 2014, uh, Kazakh President uh, Nazarbayev uh, brought up this program called uh, the Light Path, uh, which is to improve in investment in infrastructure to change the economic structure of the country to bring about economic development. So what kind of role can China play to help achieve that, those goals? Yeah. I think what is important we use using this program, uh, President Nazarbayev uh, al uh, al already initiated and already been delivered the connections of the border with Ch uh, uh, Korgos uh, in the border with uh, your country, with the different uh, uh, cities in, uh, in the border with Turkmenistan, in the Caspian uh, Sea of Shore, in, in the border with Russia. And I think that this is very good in terms of the uh, let's say the non-stop the logistics uh, scheme and non-stop uh, value added chain for trade between uh, China and the rest of the world. But, but from the other side what we need is I think that we need kind of the trans-border regulation in order uh, let's say create really, really favorable conditions for the business communities in our countries. Mm -hmm. And you think that is uh, doing that? At yes, this and moment? I think that we are in a good, uh, in the same page with uh, between governments. Right. Um, uh, Kazakhstan is the largest country in Central Asia. Uh, a lot of economic importance. I understand two thirds of the GDP of that part of the world. It is also part of the Eurasian Economic Union, which groups Russia and several uh, uh, Central Asian countries and Eastern European countries. Meanwhile, um, the Belt and Road Initiative is also a multilateral scheme. So how can co collaboration between these two countries fit in these multilateral regional schemes? I do believe that the Belt and Road is really a global, international, uh, new paradigm. And this shifting should happen on certain, like, let's say, on a few layers. So I think the, in the global layer, we, we know that uh, each two years, the, it ha uh, the special summit on Belt and Road uh, last year happened in, in Beijing, and next year also we will see the cooperation between more than 60 countries. Uh, the next layer for the region, I think, regional layer, is the cooperation between, let's say, club of Central Asia countries or club of the Eurasian Economic Union countries, mm -hmm. also with, uh, on a very high level, uh, and common understanding with the Belt and Road, and there is a certain uh, roadmap how to we should bring together different projects. We should really mm -hmm. connect these regional and global initiatives. And uh, I think, but the most efficient, I think, is a bilateral level where between China and Kazakhstan we are continuing uh, from year to year uh, execute new projects, which is uh, financing by uh, our own means or financing by multilateral uh, agencies like AAB or uh, national agencies like Silk Road Fund or Chinese Development Bank. So I think we are in a very good understanding how we structure the project with the idea that this cooperation should be really win-win in all terms. Uh, is it a balancing act that Kazakhstan uh, that has to do in terms of uh, being part of the Belt and Road Initiative and being part of the, economic, the Eurasian Economic Union? So you know that we have a large geography. The western part of China somehow connect to Europe. We have the biggest border in the world with Russia. We have access to the Caspian Sea and through Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan, through Turkmenistan to the Middle East, uh, East countries. We have a border with the Central Asian countries. So we are located in the middle mm -hmm. and now like a geographic destiny to be in a good friendship and strategic partnership with our neighborhood. So you think it is possible to, to be really I balanced? think we, we succeed the last mm -hmm. 26 years and <laughs> we will continue to do it. Right. In terms of cultural links, I think it is a very important uh, aspect. There is a strong link between Kazakhstan with the uh, uh, western part of China and uh, to other countries in Central Asia. H is that being tapped into enough at this moment? Uh, I think uh, it's good enough for this moment, uh, but it will not be enough in the future. 
And I think that uh, we now, we both presidents agree that we should increase the exchange of the students between our countries. It's very much important that the young uh, Kazakh students should study in the best universities here, like Tsinghua, like Fudan universities. We increase the, uh, the number of the Confucius institutions in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan. We should let know more to the uh, people in Kazakhstan about the rich and uh, very ancient uh, Chinese culture. It should be more exchange between museums, between the uh, many different uh, institutions in the culture area and education area. Mm -hmm. It should be more academic exchanges between the Academy of Science and the different uh, institutions and universities. By the way, Nazarbayev University recently joined to the, the alliance of the A Asian universities, which is leading by the Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, one, uh, and also definitely the touristic, uh, uh, and the Kazakhstan wants to become a touristic destination for the Chinese uh, tourists. The mm -hmm. Chinese tourists now is a significant part of the global tourism. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have uh, two beautiful cities, as new capital city Astana and the former capital city uh, Almaty, with beautiful steps and mountains. And I think I'm sure that for Chinese tourists, would be, uh, we can become a very uh, reliable and interesting touristic destination. Last year, it was a year of tu Chinese tourism mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan, and we host many millions of the Chinese tourists, uh, and we believe that uh, in the future, uh, this number would be increased. In terms of uh, perception of China in the minds of uh, Kazakhstani people, um, I believe the great majority of people are friendly. However, there are certain, as I have read in reports, certain people who believe China is a threat. Uh, do you think that is a significant issue? If so, what has to be done from our part? Uh, you know that we are strategic partners for many years. Since the very beginning, the President Nazarbayev announced uh, that we China and Kazakhstan has to be uh, in very good relationship in strategic, in security, in political, and economic, and business and cultural environment. And I think that uh, this is our achievement that in 26 years we achieved that we trust between our countries. Mm -hmm. uh, time to time, definitely, uh, different uh, forces can create different problems, but I believe that uh, we should uh, very carefully. Uh, uh, pay attention to the, uh, all the, uh, let's say, agreements between us, all the uh, uh, achievements which have been uh, achieved last uh, uh, 20 years, and we should continue our uh, business and trade and cooperation, and we will see that it will bring us a great success and result. Thank you very much, Mr. Kairat Kalimbetov, Governor of the Central Bank of uh, Kazakhstan and former Deputy Prime Minister. People know more about the ocean and space than they know about North Korea, said Aram Pan, a Singapore photographer who has been traveling to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and documenting normal people's lives, which are off limits to journalists from outside. He initiated the DPRK 360 project, which opens a window into the country through the use of photography, videos, and cutting-edge VR technology. His project has attracted many fans on social media, as well as accusations that he is spreading propaganda for the DPRK government. So what is the country really like? As a country so much in the world's spotlight, how much do we really know about it? I had the pleasure of talking to Aram Pan himself, who joined me from Singapore. I started by asking him why he chose to focus on the DPRK in the first place. The DPRK 360 project uh, started off purely out of um, curiosity. When you search, you know, like North Korea on the internet, all you see are uh, you know, very political stuff, you know, like the military, uh, the leaders, and that's all. So the first thing that came to my mind was, is there more to North Korea than, you know, meets the eye? Right. How many times have you been there and uh, throughout how long, what kind of period of time that you um, piled up your uh, portfolio and to have a substantive uh, display of work? Well, since 2013 until now, uh, I just, in fact, I just came back uh, from the DPRK uh, a couple of days ago. 
uh, that would be 17 trips and if I remember correctly it should be a total total of about 126 days. This is incredible I mean given how much we thought about the closeness of this country that is not open that people cannot go in and just take pictures and, and take them out and, and show it to the world so um, uh, what have you covered? Uh, were you able to cover many of the subjects that you wanted or will you pretty much have to be guided by people on the ground? Well, my guides have become more like friends. Uh, we, we, we have gone through so many areas in, uh, in the DPRK in North Korea and uh, I've covered most, I would say most of what I want to cover. Uh, of course, there are, there are certain sensitivities which I respect, like for example, military. Mm -hmm. You know, if we see military vehicles, military uh, personnel, and military facilities, you know, you don't photograph them, uh, which is the same as in Singapore. You know, you, you don't arbitrarily start uh, looking out for military facilities to take photos of. Um, other than that, yeah, I am very satisfied and they have given me a lot of freedom to, you know, do what I want to do. So, take a, a paint the picture for us. What are these 100,000 pictures of DPRK have shown you about this country and how have your views about this country changed since 2013? There is so much of the country that has been revealed to me, you know, people's lives, the way they do things, their culture, their attitudes. And through my photos, I've seen the progress of their whole country, you know, from the development even of, you know, packaging, advertising. Uh, in fact, uh, this latest trip, it was the first time that I had seen an LED display advertising mobile phones outside the building mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's one of those animated LED displays. Previously, you would never have seen any form of this kind of advertisement. So my photograph has catalogued the, the evolution of this country within this short period of time. So, yeah, explain to us again, uh, very, very curious. I've never been to the DPRK and I suspect the great majority of our viewers have never been to the DPRK. If you were to compare the state of the country in 2013 to a country outside, more known to the world, uh, what would you say? And then within five years' time, where the country is now? The first thing I would notice is that uh, compared 2013 to now, the country is definitely brighter. Uh, there has been you know, widespread implementation of LED lightings, uh, even in the rural areas. Uh, I think uh, they, they are finding their own way even with the sanctions, especially through the use of uh, uh, solar panels. You see solar panels popping up in rural areas also, you know, and at night uh, where it used to be dark in the rural areas, now you see little dots of light. Uh, I suspect those are the, the, the LED lights that are all going up uh, inside the houses. So it's definitely getting brighter. Um, there is I would say more consumerism mm -hmm. because I've seen it uh, firsthand uh, how you know they are developing you know their own products and developing their own packaging designs and you know they are, they are beginning to see how you know marketing plays a very important and crucial role in selling stuff so I would say that they have leaped frog. And okay, in terms of um, um, the uh, the level of economic development, um, do you, so you think that there is a certain level of adequacy that people are relatively uh, adequately clad and fed, and that uh, people have certain level of living standard. Is that the reality that you have observed? Well, from what I understand, um, the starvation and uh, you know, lack of food that their country faced in the 90s uh, has largely, you know, largely it doesn't, it's not that bad anymore and it, it, it has improved a lot. Um, they have developed a lot in terms of agriculture. Uh, in terms of, you know, when you say adequacy and, and being clothed and you, you, you know, you see people who are now beginning to be very fashion, fashion conscious. 
uh, even in the rural areas, which really surprised me. Um, you see people dressing up, you know. Uh, the women especially are becoming extremely colourful. Uh, and when you realise that a society reaches a point whereby they are concerned about their looks, you know, they are concerned about health, they are concerned about uh, products, then you realise that such a country has risen up above, you know, that subsistence level already. Tell us about one anecdote maybe that impressed you the most or one filming experience that really um, stayed with you in particular. Well, I would say the one experience that really stayed with me ended up not being a filming experience because I basically didn't capture it. Um, they have these local markets, you see, and they are developing that. Now, the thing is, from what I understand from my guys, is that they are developing their economy in such a way that they aren't ready to show the world yet. You know, uh, they have always promoted, you know, pure socialism, uh, but they are slowly moving, you know, to, to something different. And so they showed me, you know, a local market mm -hmm. whereby, you know, people buy and sell goods, they import stuff. And that was all the way up in uh, Rasson. Now, the, the agreement is, you know, we will show you, help you get an understanding. But unfortunately, in this case, you can't take any photos, you can't take any videos. I said, yeah, cool. And what amazed me was it is a market that is just like any other market that you would see, you know. Um, they have people selling, you know, meat products. They have, you know, car, automobile spare parts. They have ladies, uh, lingerie, uh, fashion items, cosmetics, you know, and all these are individual sellers. Now we, we are always told that, oh, you know, markets are illegal in North Korea. But what I see, what I've, what I've seen with my own eyes, this is legal. You know, it's a huge facility. It's about the size of a, I would say, a soccer field with many, many individual stalls and individual people selling stuff that, you know, they bring in, my, I suspect, through China. So that was an immense eye-opener. And, you, you know, you just see, and it's so nice, you know, to be there as a foreigner and you have the local people, you know, touching you and, you know, helping you try on, you know, uh, the, the, the very right. Korean, North Korean style jackets right. and, and offering you, you know, would you like to buy our food and stuff like that. So that was absolutely mind-blowing. Have you ever asked yourself why the DPRK authority wouldn't want, you to, wouldn't want you to picture this place or film this place? Well, I asked them. So they basically said, it's not time. Okay. Um, so I guess it's kind of like in their development. I see. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, people's perception of that mm. place. You said, and I quoted at the beginning of the show, that people know more about the ocean and the space than they know about the DPRK. Why is this country so deeply misunderstood or just not understood at all, at all by the outside world? Well, I think when you have a country that is a little bit more closed up and uh, in the sense mysterious, it's very easy for, you know, news to get embellished, you know, little things get blown out of proportion. Uh, take for example the news of, you know, uh, North Korea sending a man to the sun or the moon or something like that. Now, that's actually fake news. and somehow it just got spread around and people just believed it. So North Korea is such a country that it's exciting news. You know, when something comes out, you know, it gets blown out of proportion, people just chew it up and spread it quickly. So sometimes when normal images comes out, regular stuff, people tend to think, oh, could this be propaganda? Could this be fake? Because they are so used to the other extreme, which is you know, so fantastic.
Right. I was going to mention this photo that you uploaded, uh, like this one, uh, which is uh, about the Mansu Day Fountain Park in Pyongyang, if you can recall. And actually, one ah, yes. yeah, one um, mm. Facebook follower asked, why is it so empty? Judging by the shadows, it seems to be a sunny day in the early afternoon. Are the streets just emptier in North Korea? So. If mm. I think if this would have been a picture taken anywhere else, nobody would have left a comment like that. Why do you think people are not able to react to the DPRK in a common sense way? Well, I guess people are just so used to the negativity uh, from the news reports of uh, North Korea that they believe nothing good can come out of uh, the DPRK. Now, I have a lot of images of you know, local people and places filled with uh, human traffic. Now the thing is, uh, one thing I need to point out about that particular image is that it's, it's a place where it's kind of like a, near the monument mm -hmm. and it's not the kind of place where Koreans tend to want to just hang out and chill mm -hmm. or be busy. Uh, it's one of those you know, uh, monumental places that that holds special significance to them. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, Koreans treat these kind of places differently. So basically, a little bit of footnote would have been helpful. Then people would understand a little bit better. Finally, um, mm. yeah, I have so many more questions, but I, I'm running out of time. But I would like to give you the opportunity to address some of the accusations that people have flashed against you. Some people are saying you are spreading propaganda for the DPRK. Uh, how do you respond to that? Oh, well, you see, the problem is I sit in the middle. Um, I try to take a very balanced view, and my audience tend to be from both sides. You know, you have people that extremely hate the DPRK, and there are people who, uh, you know, they are really deep into the Juche ideology. Now, for me, when you present something that it's out of the norm, out of you know what the media tends to always show. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you naturally will draw a lot of flack, and in that case, there's an old saying, you know, if you are lukewarm, people spill you out. So I guess in that sense, I'm kind of lukewarm because I I'm, I'm in I'm in the middle of these two extreme camps, you know, uh, on their views of the North Cor North Koreans. So. You know, I, I'm used to it. At first, it, it is a bit sad. And, it, it, and it's especially sad when being a professional photographer, sometimes you get clients that think you work for them. Mm. But, you know, I, I wish that the North Koreans would actually like sponsor me and, you know, give me a discount, but they don't. So it's, it's unfortunate, but you, you learn to live with it. And, you know, uh, that's just the way it is. I was talking to Singaporean photographer Aram Pan, whose project, the DPRK 360, has been documenting ordinary people's lives of that country. And that is it for this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.